This is a Chem 108 lecture at York College. This is May, May 5th, not 2014. Um, and this is chapter 9. Um, yes, chapter 9. We finished chapter 8 last time. And so in chapter 8, we kind of introduced valence electrons. Um, but we're just going to review, right? Valence electrons are the outer shell of electrons of an atom. Valence electrons are the electrons that participate in chemical bonding. And so here is kind of a overview. Um, so your group 1A is going to be uh, your first column, right? Your group 2A is going to be your second column. Your group 3A is going to be over on the right, starting with boron, right? Boron, <coughs> aluminum, gallium, and so on. And then 4A, 5A, 6A, and so on. Right, and so as you, whoops, as you move down the periodic table, your main group elements, your A block elements, or your S and P block elements, this excludes what you're seeing here, excludes the transition elements, right? <coughs> um, because those have particular oddities that can be hard to predict sometimes. Um, so we have these valence electrons, right? So one through seven, and then of course the noble gases all the way on the right, those are going to have eight valence electrons. Those are going to be NS2, NP6. Right, so <coughs> you can see how this, um, the material on, on the, these three chapters this that, that are on this exam, they kind of tie together. Right? This configuration comes from chapter, these configurations come <coughs> from chapter se uh, seven. <coughs> and so one thing we can do is we can translate from the, this into what's called a Lewis dot symbol. So lithium is in group one. It has one valence electron. And so we can represent lithium as Li with one dot. <coughs> um, how many valence electrons does carbon have? Four. Yeah, so we can represent carbon with four dots, each dot representing an electron. Now there are um, <coughs> eventually we'll see that in some contexts we'll want our electrons to come in pairs. When we're just doing Lewis dot symbols, it not Lewis structures, we'll, we'll get to later, but Lewis dot symbols, the pairing is not so important, just, just the numbers. Um, once we get into more complicated stuff, the pairing is going to be more important. What I mean by pairing is, well, here you see four dots, right? How come there's not two dots on this side and two dots on that side? That kind of thing. <coughs> uh, for Lewis dot symbols, we're just looking at the number of electrons, number of valence electrons. Okay, so chapter nine, uh, I kind of skipped over the cover slide, is on bonding, right? And so we've kind of talked about bonds a little bit, and it's um, and we've uh, talked about them, but we haven't really formally met bonds, <coughs> right? Bond, ionic bonds. Um, There's uh, two major types of bonds that we're going to look at. Um, one is called ionic bond. The other one is called a covalent bond. Ionic bond is f formed, or we've met ionic compounds, right? Ionic compounds, um, how are they formed? Do you, do you recall? A metal and a nonmetal. And then what about something about electrons, right? Right, there's a transfer of electrons from the metal to the nonmetal. <coughs> and so when you transfer an electron from a metal to a nonmetal, the metal becomes positively charged, nonmetal becomes negatively charged. And then there's an a force between the positive and the negative charge, charged particles, that it, that's attractive. And that force is called an ionic bond that holds the uh, two species together. So you have lithium and fluoride, right? These are Lewis dot symbols. <coughs> lithium has the ability to lose one electron, right? 
fluori fluorine has the ability to gain one electron. And so when that happens, you get lithium plus with no valence electrons left, and fluoride minus with eight valence electrons left, or eight valence electrons. And the plus and the minus gives you the ionic bond. Right, and so you have your 1s2, 2s1, 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. And then now you have your fluorine, your fluoride is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Your lithium is just 1s2, right, or helium in terms of its electron configuration. So here's the two processes, right? L lithium loses an electron, fluorine gains an electron, <coughs> and they come together to form lithium fluoride. This is lithium fluoride, <coughs> right? Sodium, it's a white powder, as most of, uh, well, most ionic compounds are going to be solid and kind of powdery or crystalline. Right, some of them will give you very fancy crystals, some of them will give you little tiny crystals that break down into powders. Sodium chloride is another one, right? Sodium chloride is table salt, right? And you can see it is powdery, but it gives you also these little nice, nice crystals. <coughs> um, what does lithium do? Lithium fluoride. Um, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> lithium is uh, the lithium ion, is it lithium ion? The lithium itself is a, uh, a psychoactive drug, right? So um, fluoride does a lot of things. Many of them are, are bad, right? You don't want to eat this. Um, fluoride replaces phosphate in your bones and you kind of melt. Um, <coughs> um, Okay, so there's this concept here of lattice energy. We met lattice energy before um, in the context of thermodynamics, um, so we're not going to really go over it too much here, except to say that <coughs> lattice energy <coughs> um, basically ref refers to the strength of a bond, right? So the higher the lattice energy, the stronger the bond is, is going to be. So we're not going to do, in this class, we're not going to do calculations with this formula here. <laughs> um, but uh, there's some uh, trends that we should look for. So we can see, for example, that the lithium fluoride bond has a higher lattice energy. That is, it's stronger than the lithium chloride, right? And um, We'll see uh, reasons for that that have to do with charge down the uh, kind of, um, no, sorry, the, this, sorry. Okay, I'm okay. So the reason for this is that R, the distance between the ions, right? So lith fluoride, now we have to think back to chapter eight, ionic radius. Right, what has a bigger ionic radius, fluoride or chloride? Fluoride. Bigger? Chloride. Chloride is further down, right? So it's, it's bigger in the same family. So the radius for lithium fluoride is smaller. Radius is here in the basement, right? So that means this a smaller number in the basement means a bigger number overall. In other words, the closer the charges are together, the stronger the bond. That, that makes some sense, right? If you bring the positive and negative real close, they're going to form a strong bond. If they're not so close, it's going to be a weaker bond. He Sorry, go ahead. Yes, this is assuming, this is, uh, you're, we're, we're, you're getting kind of into uh, chem 2. This is assuming the lattice structures are the same. Um, here we're looking at two different charges, or at least similar enough so that the distances are um, the distances reflect the ionic radii. H MGF2, MGO, right? And so here Q is charge, right? So here MGO, it has higher, O has a charge of minus two, right? F has a charge of minus one, 
So the charge here is higher, the lattice energy is higher. Um, so again, we're not going to do calculations here, but we're going to understand principle. The lattice energy increases as Q increases or as R decreases. That is, the higher charges give you stronger bonds. Smaller ions, closer together, gives you stronger bonds. <coughs> okay, so let's think about what's going to happen uh, when we have... Okay, so now we're not really talking about the lattice energies anymore. We're just looking at MGF2. Let's think about the, their Lewis, the Lewis dot structures. Right, so what's the Lewis dot structure of magnesium metal, magnesium uncharged? Two dots. Two dots. What about fluorine uncharged? Seven dots, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And there's two of them. How about that? And we know from crossing over why this is going to have to be and the balance of charge and all that. But what's going to happen here is one of these dots is going to go here. The other one is going to go here. And so you have lost two electrons. That's two plus. Each one of these gained one electron is going to be minus. And so you're going to get, if you put it all together, you'll get MgF F. You notice that each of these ions now fulfills the octet rule, right? Or has a no another way of looking at it is each of these ions now has a noble gas electron configuration, right? Fluorine looks just in terms of its electrons looks like looks like whom? Neon, neon right? And magnesium also looks like neon, right? Because magnesium is up here, right? And so it's lost two electrons. When it loses two electrons, it's mi minus one. Minus two is going to bring it way back uh, here to neon. Okay, so ionic bonds and covalent bonds. Covalent bond. A covalent bond is a chemical bond in which two or more electrons are shared by two atoms. Right, an ionic bond, you get a transfer of an electron, one or more <laughs> electrons. Right, covalent bonds, you get sharing of electrons. And so why should two atoms share electrons? Well, let's look at F and F. If we do try to do a... And, and we know that fluorine exists as F2, right? That's something we learned about way back when we learned about which elements are diatomic. If we try, sorry, give me a second. If we try to do a transfer of an electron from one F to the other F, what's going to happen? Well, one of them is going to have eight electrons, right? The one who gains an electron, eight valence electrons, but the one that loses an electron it's going to have six, right? It doesn't want to have six. It wants to have eight. But what happens if this F decides to somehow share its electron with that F? This one decides to share one electron with that F. So that this electron counts both for the first and second F, and this electron counts both, both for the first and second F. Yes, and so what we can do is draw it like this, right? So now, you know, there's, you know, two nice, you know, <coughs> F atoms. They're, you know, I don't know, brother and sister, and they're sharing their, their cookies. And um, they're both happy, right? Because both of these two electrons that are in between the two Fs, both of those electrons count for this F <coughs> and for that F. Right, so this F has eight, this F has eight. Octet rule is fulfilled. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And so now we can start putting together what we call a Lewis structure.
structure, right? A Lewis structure is going to be a structure that's in some way derived from Lewis symbols. And here's the simplest, here's the simplest way to look at it. Um, these two electrons <coughs> that are shared, that constitutes the covalent bond. And so what we've been doing up till now, and uh, kind of making the assumption, is that we can represent that covalent bond as a line. So that line, which represents the bond, contains in it two electrons, two valence electrons. The, those two valence electrons are, sh are shared by this atom and by that atom. The rest of these, <coughs> um, now the pairing starts to become a little more important. Right? These are called lone pairs. So there's one bonding pair in the bond and one, two, three lone pairs on each F. Questions here? Right, single covalent bond. Remember, the line here represents two electrons. Implicit in this is that covalent bonds are going to generally, or when we represent a covalent bond, they're going to be pairs of electrons. Right? There's way to rep there are ways to represent if you have one or three, but the most standard way of looking at it, or the most standard way of, of drawing, and the most ordinary way of thinking about it, is that these two atoms are sharing pairs of electrons. So let's think about water. Right? Water, H2O. H dot, right? Hydrogen has one electro valence electron. The other hydrogen has one valence electron, and oxygen has six. And oxygen is in the sixth row, sixth, sixth column, and it's going to have six valence electrons. So uh, this is drawn in a way so it's set up so that you can see what's going on very easily, right? What happens is that, excuse me. This electron and this electron form a bond, and they're shared between these, this H and O. And this electron and this electron form a bond, and they're shared between this H and O. So that gives us that, and converting the bonding. <laughs> Thank you. And um, converting the bonding electrons into the covalent bond symbol, or the line, we get HOH. What we'll notice here is that hydrogen only has two electrons. Right, and why is that? A and it's happy, why is that? Not because the first sub, it, that's true, but that's, that's not the most important reason. Because n equals 1 has how many subshells? n equals 1, first row, right? It only has, it only has two electrons. It only has w an s shell, an s subshell, right? So actually, when it has two electrons, the subshell is closed, but also the shell is closed, right? n equals 1 is, is closed. <coughs> um, because there are no 1p electrons, right? That's, that's illegal. So, um, actually, it's kind of true. In uh, the physical chemistry terminology is that that would be forbidden. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, and that's, that's they, they talk about forbidden states, allowed states, and that kind of thing. Um, so we've seen elements that have double bonds, 
triple bonds. And so carbon dioxide has uh, double bonds. <coughs> um, right, so each one of these bonds is one pair or two shared electrons. So a double bond means there's two times two, or four, shared electrons. So see, each one of these is two bonds, two plus two is four, and uh, two electrons, two plus two is four. Each of these bonds is two electrons, two plus two is four. So we think about this, let's look at our oxygen. How many valence electrons are associated with oxygen? No, no, not, not oxygen by, it, by itself, oxygen in the structure here. We've got one, two, three, four, and then five, six, seven, eight. How many, and then it's the same for this, this oxygen. What about the carbon? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They all have octets, they're all happy, yes? You know in chapter 10. Um, yeah, that's, 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 a, that's a very good question, um, and that's bonding part two in chapter 10. Um, so here's another, when we talk about bonding, it's another example of kind of models, right, things that we represent in certain ways, but we can't really see. And each model um, explains some aspects of what we know about these, these compounds. So the way we present bonding really is kind of from like a simple model, I, it's kind of, it kind of builds up, right? We go with a, start with a simple model, and then it gets more and more complicated. So when we talk about Lewis structures, um, it's kind of the most simple model of bonding. And as we move forward, through the next two weeks, we'll see sort of more and more complex, some of which will take into account shapes. Right? These, these models don't, they just take into account connectivity and valence electrons. So each one of these has a, is happy in terms of its number of valence electrons. Um, let's see if we like cheated, right, or, or we did something illegal here. How many valence electrons does each oxygen start with, right, before it forms bonds? Six. So there's two of them, six plus six is 12. Right, keep that in your head. And how many does carbon start with? Four. four. So 12 plus four is 16. 16. So in this structure, we should have 16. So let's see, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. We're not lying to you. <coughs> okay, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's try something different here. Draw the Lewis structure of N2. So, how many valence electrons are in each N? Five, right? So each N has five valence electrons, so five, uh, I'm going to call them VEs, VE minus, times two, that's going to give us ten. So this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to take, and I'm going to draw this skeleton here. N must be attached to N. It's got to be. Right, and then I'm going to say to myself, I know that in order for this to be a, a happy structure, we've got to have octet, the octet rule fulfilled, except for hydrogen, which is going to have two. Right, so I'm going to just fill in electrons. So I have octets, right? So here I have two, four, six, eight, and here I have two, four, six, eight. That's, well, yes, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but that's, that's correct. So we have eight and eight uh, for each one. But the second check we do isn't going to work. 
right? And the second check is that each nitrogen has five valence electrons, so there should be a total of 10. In this structure, I have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. That's not happy, right? I, I just invented some electrons, or created some electrons. But so that's not, ha that's not happy. What's going to happen is if I draw in a double bond, in order to t keep the octets happy, I'm going to have to take two away from here, two away from here, and draw in an uh, another bond. When I do that, I get 2, 4, 6, 8 for one end, that's happy. 2, 4, 6, 8 for the other end, that's happy. But if I count 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, I have still too many. So what happened? I added one more bond, and when I did that, I got two, I got rid of two valence electrons. I need to get down to 10, so if I add one more bond, then if the same thing happens, then I'll be happy, right? So now let's think about the n, each n. 2, 4, 6, 8, that's happy. 2, 4, 6, 8, that's happy. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, total. So now I'm down to 10 valence electrons. I added another bond. Uh, for this Lewis structures, no. When we start thinking about three-dimensional structures. Yep. So you could put them here. Typically, you would put them here. But it, for the val Lewis structure to be correct, it doesn't matter. <sighs> All right. <sighs> Questions here? OK, so let's do another one. Do you remember or think back to exam one? What is this species called? Cyanide. Cyanide. Draw it. See what you can do. <coughs> the negative in this case is going to, for now, is going to apply to the whole thing. <laughs> so <laughs> the whole thing. So the minus is on the whole thing. What does that mean? So that means carbon's going to have five electrons and it's going to have eight electrons. Not eight. I mean, sorry, uh, and it's going to have eight. Well, the way I like to look at it is carbon's going to have four, nitrogen's going to have five, and then there's going to be one more okay. somewhere in there to give you the minus. One more total? Yeah, one more. No, one more total. Oh, so that it says it's going to be 10 electrons in total. Mm -hmm. So give it a try. Put your heads together and uh, do it. OK, so let's take a look. I'm going to start by doing this, CN. And uh, off in the side, I'm going to count my valence electrons. So my carbon has four, right? And my nitrogen has five. And uh, the way I like to do it is to say my negative charge has one. <coughs> and so I add that together, I'm going to have 10. Oh, I got 10 here and 10 here. That's in kind of a clue is what's going to happen. But let's do the same thing. I'm going to start this, and I'm going to say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. How many do I have? I have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. No, too many. Um, and I have how many too many? Four too many. Each time I add a multiple bond, I'm going to reduce how many? Two. So I'm going to have to add two multiple bonds. right? So what I'm going to do is take away, add one, add two. Two, four, six, eight for carbon. That's good. Two, four, six, eight for nitrogen. That's good. Two, four, six, eight, ten for the whole thing. That's also good. <coughs> and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the minus sign, put it in brackets, and put the minus sign on the whole thing. <coughs> uh, 
<laughs> We're going to come back to Lewis structures. We're going to do more and more and more Lewis structures, and it's going to get build bigger and bigger molecules. Um, that's going to become a foundation, a very important foundation for what you do in organic chemistry. Those of you who go on to take organic. Um, but first, we're going to take a, a, a quick kind of summary of, of the different types of bonding. So here's a comparison of some general properties of an ionic compound and a covalent compound, or a molecular compound that has covalent bonds. <coughs> um, At room temperature, ionic compounds tend to be solid, right? Whereas these molecular compounds can be solid, liquid, or gas, <coughs> um, and they're very variable. The melting point of an ionic compounds are very high. That's why they tend to be solids, right? Because the melting points are very high. And they're high because you have this very powerful uh, attractive force right between the positive and the negative and that's hard to separate you have a high lattice energy whereas <coughs> in the uh, <coughs> when you have covalent bonds molecular compounds with covalent bonds the melting point tends to be much lower there's some other stuff that we're not really going to look at that much but uh, boiling points again tend to be high for uh, co uh, ionic compounds, not so high for molecular compounds. And for um, electro electrical conductivity, solids, uh, solid ionic compounds tend not to conduct electricity because even though they're made up of charged particles, in a solid, those charged particles are basically held in place. They don't, mo they don't freely migrate. <coughs> Even though ionic compounds are difficult to melt, you need to have a very high melting point, high temperature, they will eventually melt. Um, and once they've melted, once they're in the liquid phase, ionic compounds become very good electro electrical con uh, conductors. That's because the charged particles in the liquid phase are now free to move. Right, so the positive charges can move, the negative charges can move, you can conduct a current. <coughs> um, whereas covalent compounds or covalently bonded compounds tend to be poor conductors, both in the solid and the liquid phase. Right, don't memorize these numbers, it's, it's pointless. Um, another thing that we're going to look at is covalent bond length. Right, so <coughs> when we're looking at covalent bond length, what we're really kind of thinking about is atomic radius. Right? It's not ionic radius because you're not forming ions, you're not forming charged particles. We're more or less correlating these bond lengths with, uh, with the atomic radius. So if you compare H2 to HI, <coughs> if you recall, back, recall chapter 8, H, I mean, one H is the same, right? This other one has HH, or one of them has two H's. One of them has an H and an I. Um, when you put the two of them together, or when you, when you put the two of them together, the one that has a larger atomic radius is going to give you a larger bond length. But that's only part of the story. And that's only part of the story. The other part of the story has to do with how many bonds you're forming. So if we look over here, C O versus C double bond C single bond O versus C double bond O, the double bond is shorter than the single bond. Right? And if we look at C single bond C, C double bond C, C triple bond C, as you go from single to double trip to triple, also the bond length gets shorter. Same as you look here for NO single bond and NO double bond and so on. So as you go from triple bond, as you increase the number of bonds, the bond length, okay, well, let's look at it this way. As you decrease the number of bonds, 
the distance between the atoms gets bigger. As you in increase the number of bonds, the distance between the atoms gets sh shorter. <coughs> and, <laughs> no, yes, we're, okay. So, no, no, I was looking for something. <laughs> um, I was looking for a particular slide, which I think is at the end, and I'll just jump to that. What's that? What do you think? No. No. <coughs> and um, connected to bond length is this concept called bond enthalpy. Bond enthalpy is the enthalpy change, or the heat, the energy, required to break a particular bond in one mole of, a gaseous, of gaseous molecules. So <coughs> one mole in the gaseous molecules is basically just to make everything equal. But um, the enthalpy change is, is the trend is similar to bond length, right? So <coughs> the bond enthalpy for breaking a hydrogen-hydrogen bond, for example, is going to be for something, right? For 36.4 kilojoules, it's actually going to be kilojoules per mole. Chlorine, kilojoules per mole, and so on. And there's, there's again, these are not m numbers you need to memorize, but what we do want to see, <coughs> what we do want to um, point out is as you go from a single bond to a double bond to a triple bond, the bond enthalpy increases. Right, so what does that mean? That means particularly if you're looking at the same atoms, so if you have an O single bond O, that's going to have a lower bond enthalpy than an O double bond O, which is going to have a lower bond enthalpy than a O triple bond O, if, if we were to form such a thing. So uh, does the bond length increase, the bond enthalpy increase? As the bond lengths increase, the bond enthalpies decrease. Right. <coughs> and so the longer, th <coughs> yeah, exactly. So bond enthalpy is another word for the strength of the bond, right? How much energy it takes to break the bond. <coughs> so triple bonds are stronger than double bonds, are stronger than single bonds. Triple bonds are shorter than double bonds, are shorter than single bonds. We'll come back to bond enthalpy after we do a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, let's take a break. Okay. So we learned about um, ionic bonds. Right, ionic bonds is when you transfer an electron from one species to another species. Right, we learned about covalent bonds, and that's when electrons are shared. Um, but now we also, but but you have this um, situation, I guess, often amongst siblings. Right, <coughs> um, who who here has has siblings? Right, so most of you do. Who who's an Younger sibling, yeah. So if you have, you know, you and your older sibling, and and your your mother tells you, you know, share the cookies, or share the potato chips, um, you know, there's there's sharing, and th there's sharing, right? Um, <laughs> and sometimes, you know, maybe you're the, um, you, you maybe you're this, you know, spoiled little little sibling, and you you get, you know. And you get you get uh, most of them, or maybe your older siblings, you know, mean and mean and nasty, and you get like one potato chip, right? Um, and so that's where this concept comes in: polar covalent bonds. Polar covalent bonds are covalent bonds in the sense that electrons are shared between the two atoms in the bond, um, but they're not shared evenly, right? And um, the way that this is worded here, that means there's greater electron density around one of the two atoms. In other words, one of the two atoms gets more potato chips. And so if we think about, <coughs> for example, hydrogen fluoride, the HF bond, 
here is a view of here's a view of that bond or, or that molecule um, that illustrates this. So the electrons are indeed being shared, but here you have kind of a charge distribution map. And the way these are standardly presented is that red indicates a negative charge and blue indicates a positive charge. And so there's more negative or there's red around the F. There's more positive or there's blue around <coughs> the H. What does that mean? That means there's this pair of electrons. There's a single bond, right? That means there's two electrons, a pair of electrons, that are being shared between the H and the F. And but who's getting more cookies? F. F, right? F is taking more of the electrons. And the way we say that is there's a greater density, electron density, around the fluorine. How can we tell what's going to have, where, where the electrons are going to go, where the electron density is going to go? Right, we need a, uh, the, the, well, I don't know if we need, but there is a scale called the electronegativity scale. And, right, the electronegativity scale tells us, oh, oh, okay, before we get there, one way of writing this is there's a delta, this is a lowercase delta, partial negative, where the electron rich uh, region is, and a delta plus, or a partial positive, where the electron poor region is. Is the delta, delta the triangle? Yeah, so that's a capital delta, right? The, the, there's uppercase and lowercase, right? So that's a capital delta, that means change. The lowercase delta is kind of like a D with a little tail on it, <coughs> um, and that means basically a, par a partial charge. So what is electronegativity? Electronegativity is the ability of an atom within a chemical bond to attract electrons toward itself. This is somewhat similar to the quantity that we learned about in chapter 8 called electron affinity. Right, electron affinity um, is a little different though, right? Electron affinity is the ability to gain an electron, right? So for a neutral atom to gain an electron. Whereas electronegativity is not gaining a whole electron. It's just pulling the, uh, it's already in a chemical bond and it's pulling the electrons toward itself. <coughs> and so electron affinity is something you can measure, you can put <coughs> energy on, right? Kilojoules or something, kilojoules per mole. Whereas electronegativity is not something you can measure, right? It's very difficult to put a real value of joules or something on it. And it has to do with the electron sharing within a bond. When you're, yeah? Mostly, um, we think about electronegativity when we think about whether a bond is ionic or covalent or polar. Um, but strictly speaking, yeah, I think we would think about it most in terms of covalent bonds. So here's a table of the electronegativities of common elements. And what you'll notice, do you need to me memorize this? No, you don't. Um, but what you'll notice is that the highest electronegativity is in the upper right-hand corner, and the lowest electronegativities are in the lower left-hand corner. And as you go across, again, we're going to skip over the transition elements for now, but as we go from left to right in a, f in a, in a, in a period, in a row, it increases. As we go from top to bottom in a row, it decreases. Right, and unlike electron affinity and ionization energy, there's, n except in the transition elements, again, which we're not going to think about right, uh, for, this for, for, for this curriculum, it doesn't have these blips, right? It doesn't have these blips where you have these, like, ha uh, stable half-filled P-shell or filled S-subshell, that kind of thing. It just goes increasing from left to right, increasing from left to right, decreasing from top to bottom. Yeah. Why does fluorine have the highest electronegativity? <coughs> um, 
why? Because that's a, that's a good question. Florian basically um, I guess the way to think about it is Florian has the it, it is related to the electron affinity, right? The electron of fluorine likes very much to gain an electron, right? Except in the context of electronegativity, it's not gaining a whole electron. But it's still, it's kind of happy if it gains some electron, right? If it pulls some electron toward itself. And so fluorine has um, the highest electronegativity um, because it likes more than all the other elements to pull electrons toward itself. Um, and it does that because uh, it's quite small, right? So the, um, there's not a lot of shielding. And it only needs one more electron to get to a closed shell. And you'll notice that krypton and xenon so have electronegativity. So f and they follow the same trend. So far, we've thought about we ha uh, we haven't really thought about um, <coughs> compounds that have noble gases in them. They are very very rare, but they do exist under certain special cases, and they actually fit the trend. So increasing and increasing. Yeah. So since metals give electrons and non-metals accept, that would have to do with this. Anyway. Yeah, it's it's related. And so we can see again. Low electronegativity, the high electronegativity. Once you start getting these, uh, the transition elements, you start getting some blips, and we're not going to really think about those blips. Okay, so <sighs> what type of bond you're looking at, you can, th or, or you have, you can classify them based on differences in electronegativity between the two atoms in the bond. And so there's some textbooks or some places where you'll look and it'll say if the difference between the one element and the other element is like 2.1 or something, then it's ionic or then it's covalent. We're not going to use specific cutoff points because it it's, it's really is um, kind of a sliding scale. If you're sharing the potato chips with your, with your sibling, right, and there's when does it become unfair, right? Well, that depends. <coughs> that depends on what your, your standards of fairness are, right? If there's, or, or cookies, right? If there's 10 cookies and you get six and your brother gets four, is that fair? Well, maybe, but maybe not, right? And so we're going to say if the difference between, in the electronegativity between the two elements is small, the bond is going to be covalent or nonpolar covalent. If this difference is big, it's going to be ionic. And if the difference is intermediate, it's going to be polar covalent. Wait, what's the difference in the difference in electronegativity is between the two atoms or the two elements in the bond. So if we look over here, if we think about our Ionic compounds, right? Our, 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 our ionic compounds are up on the top. Lithium fluoride, for example, potassium bromide, KCl, KF. If we just look at, say, lithium fluoride, what's the electronegativity of lithium? Well, it's 1.0. And the electronegativity of fluorine? 4. So that's. 4.0 minus 1.0 equals 3.0. On a scale that goes up to 4, 3 is quite large. <sighs> now if, we, sorry? So that would be ionic. And we know it's ionic because it's lithium fluoride, because it's a metal and a nonmetal. Now if we were to take a look at like H2O, right, H has an electronegativity of 2.1. O has an electronegativity of 3.5. The difference there is 3.5 minus 2.1 equals 1.4. That's quite a bit smaller than 3, but it's quite a bit bigger than 0. 
Right, so that's going to be polar covalent. If we look at something like, uh, yeah. Is that like a range? See, that's what I said we're not going to do. Um, in, if you look in some books, they'll give you a specific range, but the borders are very fuzzy. Um, so, you know, this is clearly ionic. This is polar covalent. But if you're in between like 2, 2.1, some people would say those are ionic. Some would say they're polar, you know, that kind of thing. So if we get really small, let's say we go to CH, the CH bond. <coughs> Carbon is 2.5. Hydrogen is 2.1. The difference is 0 0.4. That's something we would classify as small. And so there's a class of compounds called hydrocarbons that are just made up of carbon and hydrogen. And those are going to be nonpolar compounds. So because we're not using these ranges and specifying, you know, if the difference is smaller than one or bigger than one, that kind of thing, we're just saying if it's big, if it's medium, if it's small, we can't obviously ask you on an exam based on the difference in electronegativities, <coughs> is it polar or not polar? What we can ask you is, which of the following bonds is the most, let's say this, the most polar? And we could say CH, NH, and OH. OH. Yeah, OH, because you know the trend, you know H is smaller than all of them, right? And as you go from the left to the right, what happens? It gets bigger. <sighs> so the difference between CH is small and H is small. The difference between N and H is kind of bigger but medium. And the difference between O and H is even bigger. So the most polar is going to be the OH. So which of the following bonds is going to be the least polar? Oh, I'm just going to write a new list. O, O, N, O, or C, O? O, O. What's the difference between O and O? Zero, zero right? 3 minus 3, or 3.5 minus 3.5 is zero. Whenever you have two atoms that are the same, that are bonded to each other, that's a sure sign that it's nonpolar, right? Because the difference between the two of them is, is zero. <sighs> right, and so, yeah. Yeah. No, no, if it's intermediate, it's polar covalent. If the difference is big, it's going to be ionic, right? And if the difference is small, it's nonpolar, right? So, so if the difference is zero, like Cl2, it's definitely nonpolar. So on your exam, you'll see things like, you know, which is the most polar, which is which bond is the most polar, which bond is the most nonpolar, that kind of thing. Those would make uh, great multiple choice questions, right? Um, I'm just saying. <coughs> What's that? Okay, so this we're gonna. Uh, okay, so this we're gonna skip over because we did, did stuff just like it. Okay, so now we know electronegativity, and we're going to revisit our Lewis structures. So far, we've just drawn these Lewis structures of these very simple atoms, right? uh, very simple compounds like N2 or an ion like cyanide or H2O. And now we're going to look at um, some more, uh, start to look at some more complex Lewis structures. So here, um, here's kind of the procedure. We, 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 we went through this procedure, basically, um, but a little more formal here. Draw the skeletal structure of the compound. That's just take the atoms and connect them with single bonds. 
showing where the atoms are bonded to each other. Put the least <coughs> electronegative element in the center. Right, so that's um, a general rule. <coughs> um, that's almost always going to be the case, right? In the case of water, that wasn't the case, but most of the time this is going to be the case. Put the least electronegative element in the center. <sighs> Count the number of total valence electrons, right? That's what we did when we did, you know, nitrogen has five, carbon has four, that kind of thing. Add one for each negative charge and subtract one for each positive charge. We did that, right? Complete an octet for all the atoms except for hydrogen. Hydrogen gets two valence electrons. And once you're done with that, if the structure that you got in three has too many valence electrons based on what you added up in two, then you have to start forming double and triple bonds. And in this class, we're going to start putting, we're going to put them on the central atom. So let's draw the Lewis structure of nitrogen trifluoride, NF3. NF3. So how many um, valence electrons in N? N gives you five. How many in F? Seven. 21 valence electrons plus five valence electrons. And so that's going to give us 26 total. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to put the, draw a skeletal structure with the least electronegative element in the middle. Which is the least electronegative? It's got to be nitrogen because fluorine is the most electronegative out of everybody. So nitrogen's got to be in the middle. Another hint is there's only one of them, whereas there's three fluorines. And we're going to draw our skeletal structure. We counted our total valence electrons. And then now we're going to do this step. Complete the octet for all the atoms except for hydrogen. There's no hydrogen. So we're going to complete the octet for all of them. So nitrogen has 2, 4, 6. To complete the octet, how many more do we need? 2, 8. Each fluorine has 2, right? And so it needs how many more? 6. And so now what we need to do is count and see if what we have here equals what we have here. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26. So we have 26 valence electrons calculated, 26 valence electrons that we counted. And so they're the same, and so we're happy. And that's exactly what we did here, so we're not going <coughs> to look at that. What? That slide that I just flipped through was exactly this. So now let's look at this one. The carbonate ion. So carbonate CO3 2 minus first thing we're going to do, or one thing that we're going to do, order actually isn't so important. I like to count up the valence electrons first. So carbon has how many? Four. Oxygen has how many? Four. So 3 times 6 equals 18. And the 2 minus is going to be 2. And so that's going to ha have a total of 24. Right? 4 plus 18 plus 2 is 24 total valence electrons. Now I'm going to draw my skeletal structure.
and the skeletal structure is going to have the least electronegative element in the middle. Which one is less electronegative, C or O? C. And because you go from left to right, the electronegativity increases. So I'm going to do C, O, O, O. And then what I'm going to do next is I'm going to fill in, I'm not going to try to figure out double and triple bonds yet. I'm just going to try to fill in all the octets. So this actually looks kind of like this, right? So I'm just going to fill it in the same way and then count. And I bet you I'm going to get 26, just like I got here. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26. 24 is what I calculated. 26 is what I got. So what I need to do is I need to put in a double bond, right? So if I put in a double bond, well, now here this is kind of the question. Where do I put in that double bond? C to the top O or C to the side O or C to the other side O. Could be any of them. I'm just going to pick one for now. For now. And when I do that, I get 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. Equal. So far, so good. I'm happy, right? I got the right. All my atoms have octets. And all my, uh, and I have the right number of total valence electrons. <coughs> but I have a double bond here, and a single bond here, and a single bond here. Now, what if I told you that there's experimental evidence that says all three bonds are the same length and all three bonds have the same bond enthalpy? Right? <coughs> what is re remember what we said about bond length and bond enth enthalpy. Double bonds should have a shorter length and a higher enthalpy. But they're all actually the same. And the, the so, so and that's actually true, right? So all three CO and a carbon oxygen CO bonds have the same length and enth bond enthalpy. That's one point here. And the second point is. The bond length is longer than a typical CO single bond, and sh but sh sorry, shorter than a typical. CO single bond, but longer than a typical CO double bond. The same thing for bond enthalpy, right? Or, you know, the bond enthalpy is uh, greater than a single bond, less than a double bond. That tells me two things. That, that tells me two things. That tells me that all the bonds are the same, because the length and the enthalpy of all three bonds are the same. And it tells me that it's part way between a single bond and a double bond. And so what that means is when we draw in our double bond, it's not really that there's a double bond between one and the other. It's that there's, it's that all three are the same. Right? And so the way that we draw this is, this, right? It could be C double bond there. It could be C double bond here.
and it could be C double bond here. And the way we draw it is, I should have left a little more space, is with these double-headed arrows. So one line <coughs> with two arrowheads on it. We put the whole thing into brackets. Put our charge on it, two minus. <coughs> so these double-headed arrows means that the structure is not this, it's not this, it's not this, but it's some kind of average of all three structures. You kind of put all three structures and moosh them together, and you get the real structure. Another way that this is sometimes written would be something like this. The problem with this is it's hard to draw in your valence electrons so that the count is right. right so in organic chemistry, sometimes you'll see, see stuff like this, but how do you draw in like one and a half or one and a third valence electrons or something like that? So this is really, in terms of the bonding, what it looks like. Each one of these has one and a third bonds. It's not a single bond. It's not a double bond. But to draw in the valence electrons in our Lewis structure, we need to use what we call these resonance structures. It doesn't mean that the structure is changing between these three. It means that the real structure is an average of those three structures. <coughs> and so this is. So how do we know if the structure is a resonance structure? So. Um, I thought they're colors. They're all the bonds. It turns out that, at least in introductory chemistry, any time you see a situation like, that, like this, where you're not sure where to put the double bond, it's always going to be a resonance structure. Right? It's always going to have resonance structures. Yeah. Isn't that called like, um, isomers, like the ones? It's not quite isomers. Isomers are um, different compounds, they're connected differently, but they have the same elements. But this, these aren't really different molecules that are connected differently. They're different representations of a single molecule. Right, we're going to see isomers right now. And so the next one we're going to look at is CH2O. And so, in this case, okay, we're going to count the total valence electrons. C has four. H is going to be two times one. And O is going to be six, right? And so there's going to be a total of two, 12. 12 valence electrons. <sighs> we good there? Yeah, I think. And in this case, the central atom is going to be the carbon, right? So the exception to the rule where the electronegativity rule is that the hydrogen is never going to be your central atom, right? Because it can only form one bond. So carbon is going to be our central atom. And then there's two different ways we can do this. We can do C, O, H, H. And it turns out that you could also do this, C, O, H, H. Two different skeletal structures. For um, C, what if you make a double bond with O? Yeah, so it turns out in both cases, where if you do the counting and so on, you're going to get a C double bond with the O. <coughs> and um, I'm just going to give you the final products. Right, and you can, we can confirm that they're correct. So we have an octet, right? Two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight, two, two for each hydrogen. And a total of two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, right? And then here the hydrogens each have two, carbon, two, four, six, eight, oxygen, two, four, six, eight. How many total? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. So both of these structures 
according to the rules that we set forth before, they're legitimate structures. Right? They're both, neither of them are illegal. Right? They've fulfilled all our rules. So which one of these is correct? And so the word that uh, was brought up is that these are isomers. Right? These are two molecules that have the same atoms in them. The same, they're both CH2O. But based on their connectivity, they're different. And one of them is actually the preferred structure of formaldehyde. We're going to explain that. I didn't tell you which one yet, right? And the preferred structure has to do with putting more, well, two things, right? So it, it has to do with whether, uh, well, okay, let's, let, let's present it this way. It has to do with a concept called formal charge. And so formal charge is kind of a way to ac account for where the electrons go. And um, Sorry. And so <laughs> um, carbon has in its uh, unbonded form four valence electrons. So it likes to have associated with it four, in some sense, in the formal charge sense that I'm going to explain, four electrons associated with it. <coughs> Oxygen has six valence electrons in its unbound state. And it likes to have, again, in this formal charge sense that I haven't explained yet, it likes to have six electrons associated with it. <sighs> if you can't do that, the more electronegative atoms like to have more negative, and the less electronegative atoms like to have more positive. So if we can't exactly get that to work, we want to put more electrons on the electronegative atoms and less electrons on the more, less electronegative atoms. So to formal charge is a way of keeping track of what electrons go with what atoms. OK. And so the formal charge, let's just uh, draw this a little better, is going to be, uh, well, let's go to the, uh, let's go to the slide. Um, uh, just do what the slide says is a difference between the number of valence electrons in the isolated atom, that means the atom unbonded, and the number of electrons assigned to that atom in a Lewis structure. So the electrons assigned to the atom on the Lewis structure are as follows. Each non-bonding pair, each non-bonding electron counts as one electron for that atom. So for carbon, the non in this structure, the carb there's two from the non-bonding electrons. Now, for each bond, we're going to kind of split the bond. One electron, just for the formal charge sense, right? Not they're really shared, but when we're doing formal charge. One of them is going to count for the carbon, and one of them is going to count for the hydrogen. Over here, we split the double bond. Two of them count for the carbon. Two of them count for the oxygen. And so the way that one way to look at it is the number of valence electrons in the free atom minus the non-bonding electrons <coughs> minus the number, half the number of bonding electrons, because half because you split the bond. So let's keep this up and let's draw this like this, right, so we can see everything all at once. Let's calculate the formal charge for the hydrogen. Hydrogen by itself likes to have one electron, or has one valence electron, right? So it's going to be one minus, it has no non-bonding electrons, right? And it has one over here, right? It has two bonding electrons, half of that is one. So one minus zero minus one equals zero. 
So hydrogen is going to have a formal charge of zero. What about the carbon? Carbon starts with four, right? Minus two non-bonding electrons, minus three. And so that's going to be negative one. What about the oxygen? Oxygen starts with six. So for the oxygen, it starts with six minus two minus three equals positive one. And this H is also one minus zero minus one equals zero. OK, so over here, the hydrogens are, e are, are the same here. They're both going to be 1 minus 0 minus 1 equals 0. Now, put your heads together gently and find the four. It starts with 4. How many non-bonding pairs? Or how many non-bonding electrons? 0. How many bonds? 4, right? So we s 8 electrons, we split them, we get 4. 4 minus 0 is 0. Oxygen has starts with six. How many non-bonding electrons? Four minus two, right, equals zero. So what we said is we want to match up the number of electrons associated with each atom in the, in the molecule with the number that it likes to have by itself. So the formal, charge, formal charges of zero are good. Right? The lower the formal charge, the better. And so we, here we have all zeros. That's going to be <coughs> um, the better structure. Here you have a plus one and a minus one. Not so good. No, they're not bonded the same way. Right? Look at the how they're connected. Right, this, I just rewrote the, uh, the H from down here to over here, just because this was going out, out, the, out the board. So, okay, so this we just went through. We just went through all of that. And we went through all of that. Wait, 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 wait. So, for neutral molecules, a Lewis structure in which there are no formal charges is preferable to one where formal charges are pre present. So this one has no formal charges. They're all zero. And so that one's preferable to the one in which formal charges are present. If you can't do that, sometimes you won't be able to draw a structure where the formal charges are all zero. If that's the case, Lewis structures with small formal charges are better those than those with large formal charges. So plus 1 is better than, and minus 1 is better than plus 2 and minus 2. It's better than plus 3 and minus 3. And if you have Lewis structures that have similar distributions of formal charge, like if they're, you have two structures, both of them have a plus 1 and minus 1, the best structure is the one where the negative formal charges are on the electronegative atoms. And so one more thing is the total formal charge, if you add up all the formal charges, <coughs> equals the charge on the structure. So these are neutral, right? These are molecules. The total charge on the structure is zero. You add up the formal charges, they're going to be zero. <coughs> if we were going to do what we had before, CO3, 2 minus, what you would notice, and maybe we'll do that next time, <coughs> is that the formal charge, when you add up the formal charges on all of the atoms, they're going to equal minus 2. <coughs> um, let's, real quick. We did this, right? Cn minus. What's the formal charge on C? It's going to be 4 minus 2 minus 3, negative 1. N is going to be 5 minus 2 minus 3 equals 0. Negative 1 plus 0 is negative 1. Matches negative 1. 
<clears throat> See you on Thursday.